Okay. What you see here is actually a kiln. This is used to be in much better condition than it is now. It's even deteriorated in the 10 or 20 years that I've seen it, but it was uh, uh, the top of the kiln went all the way ar around. Now the discussion has been, is this just a, a, a kiln for making bread? Is it a kiln for uh, pottery, a potter's kiln, as the sign says? He says artist's oven, but a potter's kiln. Or uh, could more serious things like weaponry be made here? In fact, there is a more serious kiln over there by the, um, by the um, cistern that we saw as we entered this uh, settlement. And um, so they had several kilns here. The issue well, coming down to metal, and of course they must have made plow, uh, plowshare metal and other sorts of metal things to do their farming with, uh, is weaponry. Whether, weaponry were, whether it was capable of manufacturing weaponry here or not. And the partisans of the peaceful Essenes say, oh, these people would never have dreamed of, uh, of doing anything to make weapons, yet there is another kiln there that could be used for metal. And of course, the, more, uh, the partisans of the more aggressive militant Essenes, the Zealot Essenes, originally the Zealot theory was championed by a man called Cecil Roth, of Oxford University and um, uh, G.R. Driver, his colleague there. Uh, so um, they laid it out in great detail. Even Yigal Yadin, in studying the war scroll, the famous Israel general who purchased the other scrolls from Israel in New York after the um, Syriac Metropolitan offered them for sale in the Wall Street Journal in 1952, he thought that the war scroll was uh, uh, um, displayed Roman military tactics, contrary to some of the other people we've heard, and um, that he could trace that these were Roman uh, military t tactics. G.R. Driver felt the same thing. And I think it's pretty clear the Katim, the foreign armies, uh, the, seemed to be Imperial Romans, that there was some feeling that this group was preparing for a final apocalyptic war of the, against the Roman Empire. Now you say... You can cut what you need out of here. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm getting on a roll here. I want to finish it up. Mm -hmm. You say, you say this is preposterous. You say this is preposterous. How can this group imagine that they could be preparing for a final apocalyptic war against the Roman Empire? You could say the same thing about Bin Laden out in Afghanistan now. And I hate to compare this group to a Bin Laden type group. But bin Laden is an Islamic righteous teacher of sorts. I'm sure Muslims would consider him a righteous teacher, an old man of the mountain. And here you have another group who has documents, very incriminating documents about final war and very aggressive things about, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, shunning the sons of the pit, meaning all backsliding Jews and Romans and, and so on. And they had the idea that if they were perfectly pious, and here's where the Jesus picture does not fit in with the scrolls. So we can't say this is the Jesus movement if we accept the gospel picture or the Pauline theology. They had the idea if you were perfectly righteous, that you would be like the angels and a son of God. So they had an adoptionist, an adoptionist notion of sonship. It's in the Dead Sea Scroll hymns that you are the sons of the father. You were brought up on his lap. But you had to be perfectly righteous. And number two, you had to be perfectly pure. In other words, you had to follow these daily bathing ritual purity routines. Not only as far as bodily purity, but in terms of the pure foods that you consume. They had a special food uh, uh, situation that, that you consume. And you know, just like we were speaking about, the war scroll bars from the camp all the people that Jesus sits with in the Gospels. The lame, the crippled, people with a running fount, that is people who have a sexual, uh, maybe a wet dream the night before, or a sexual disorder of some kind, people who have slept with a, women, a woman the previous night. For instance, if you know the story of David and Uriah the Hittite. When David steals Uriah the Hittite's wife Bathsheba, Uriah the Hittite comes back from the battlefield and refuses to walk into his household. Why? Because he's in a state of ritual purity, and to go into his wife would, 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 would affect his ritual purity state for holy war. So he sleeps on the doorstep where David, the bounder that he's portrayed as being in that story, and Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, know David is, 
is, is, uh, is a problem on that story. There's a reference in the Damascus document to David's behavior on that story. In any case, Uriah the Hittite sleeps outside because he does not want to affect his ritual uh, purity status by coming near a, wo a woman. So the war scroll and some of the other documents say no women, no young man below puberty, no one in a state of uncleanness, no blind, no deaf, no lame can enter the camps. Why? Because they're practicing perfection there, the way of perfection. The way in the wilderness is the way of perfection. This is crazy stuff. I'm not uh, anyone saying this isn't crazy stuff. It's fanatical. It is fanatical. But these people are beautiful. They're beautiful losers. They're totally committed, and they have this beautiful poetic idea of the world. You have to Open your soul to appreciate how splendid their, uh, their ideology and beautiful uh, uh, mindset was. So what's the last point in this thing? The holy angels were with them in their camps. The holy angels marched with them in, the, in, in their camps. This shows that we're not peaceful Essenes here. They didn't see the holy angels as pretty putty on the uh, wall of some renaissance ceiling that you see in Italy or something like this, little cupids around holy poly things with, with roly poly things with uh, wings. They saw the holy angels as militant. The holy angels were an army of God. The holy angels were their atomic bomb, their secret weapon. The thing Bin Laden is, if you like, threatening us with now, who knows what's coming in his next series of, of, of threats. But they believed that if they had a perfectly righteous life, perfect bodily purity, led by the Messiah, and that's why you have all the quotes in the Gospels and the New Testament and in the pictures of James in the apocryphal text of the Messiah Jesus or the Messiah himself coming on the clouds of heaven. What are the clouds of heaven? In the war scroll, the clouds of heaven are interpreted as the as the heavenly host in all of its armament, who shed judgment on earth like rain on all that grows, the just and unjust alike, something like an atomic rain. This is what these people believe. This is what they were uh, preparing for. We think it is crazy, but at that time, it's splendid poetry.